In the tablet of the world, Lohe Dunya, revealed shortly before his ascension, Baha'u'llah described the loftiness of the station of the hands of the cause of God. This film is about these God-intoxicated heroes and heroines of the Baha'i faith, each of whom was elevated to the rank of Hand of the Cause, either during their lifetimes or on their passing, by Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, or by Shari Effendi. Committed to the principles and teachings of Baha'u'llah, these valiant souls expended all their energies towards the advancement and protection of his cause, while maintaining a life free from fanaticism and dogma. They associated with people in friendship and harmony and pursued their careers. Yet their entire lives were energized by the single purpose of serving their Lord and diffusing his divine fragrances to everyone they encountered. This film is also about the hands as a body an institution with accomplishments unprecedented in the annals of religious history. By the close of 1951, Shoghi Effendi had set in motion the initial stages for the establishment of the two mighty arms of the administrative order of the faith of Baha'u'llah. The first was the International Baha'i Council, appointed by him in January of that year, which would develop in due course into a duly elected Universal House of Justice. This was in fulfillment of the prophecies of Baha'u'llah revealed in the Tablet of Carmel, which foretell of the development of the world center and its institutions. The other arm was the institution of the hands of the cause of God, which in accordance with the will and testament of Abdul Baha, the divine charter for the development of the institutions of the faith, was reserved for the guardian to appoint. The time had now come for the appointment of individuals to fulfill the sacred functions of the propagation and preservation of the unity of the faith of Baha'u'llah. The first contingent was announced to the Baha'i world on the 24th of December 1951 and included William Sutherland Maxwell, Mason Remy, and Amelia Collins from the Holy Land. Valiullah Varga, Tarazullah Samandari and Ali Akbar Furutan from Persia, the cradle of the faith, Horace Holly, Dorothy Baker, and Leroy Iowis from the American continent, and George Townsend, Hermann Grossmann, and Ugo Giacchieri from the European continent. The second contingent of hands was announced by the beloved guardian to the Baha'i world only some two months later, on the 29th of February, 1952, via this cablegram which brought the total number of hands to 19. Siegfried Schopflocker from Canada, Corin True from the United States, Zekrullah Khadem and Shuaullah Aloi from Persia, Adelbert Mushlegel from Germany, Musa Banoni from Africa, and Clara Dunn from Australia. After the appointment of the second contingent of hands in 1952, individual appointments were made by Shoghi Effendi as existing hands passed away in order to maintain 19 living hands at all times. Thus, after the passing of Sutherland Maxwell, his daughter Amatul Bahar Ruhia Hanum was appointed. 
On the passing of Siegfried Schopflocker from Canada, Jalal Khazé of Persia was appointed. On the passing of Dorothy Baker, Paul Haney from the United States was appointed. On the passing of Valiullah Varga, his eldest son, Ali Mohammed Varga, was appointed. And on the passing of George Townsend, Agnes Alexander from Japan was appointed. The last contingent of living hands, comprising eight individuals, was announced just a month before the passing of Shoghi Effendi, bringing the total number of living hands to a figure of three times nine, 27. From this moment, the hands were entitled Chief Stewards of Baha'u'llah's Embryonic World Commonwealth. The full list of hands now included Enoch Olinga, William Sears, and John Robarts from Africa. Hassan Valuzi and John Ferraby from the British Isles. Collis Featherston and Rahmatullah Muhajir from the Pacific area, and Abul Qasim Faizi from the Arabian Peninsula. In this part, we focus on the activities of the hands as an institution, following the appointment of the first two contingents. At the bidding of Shoghi Effendi, the hands began attending the four intercontinental conferences in Africa, America, Europe, and Asia, associated with the observance of the Holy Year in 1953 and the launch of the Guardian's 10-year globe encircling crusade. This was a time of joy and jubilation as Baha'is from around the world gathered at the intercontinental conferences in Kampala, Chicago, Stockholm, and New Delhi to celebrate these twin events and focus on the teaching work ahead. Many of the hands of the cause can be identified in films from those historic gatherings. Making reference to the goals of the Tenure Crusade. In Kampala, the hands were individually acknowledged. They include Hand of the Cause Tarazullah Samandari, Dorothy Baker, Musa Banani, Valiullah Varga, Shuallah Aloi. Ali Akbar Furutan, Leroy Iowas, and Zikrullah Khaden. Hands attending the Intercontinental Conference of Chicago can be seen against the background of the map of the 10-year Global Crusade. Hands gathered at the third of the Intercontinental Conferences held in Stockholm are seen here followed by the banquet attended by all the friends. And last but not least, the memorable conference held in Delhi was attended by many friends and Hands of the Cause of God. On that occasion, a delegation of Hans and Baha'i friends had a meeting with the Vice President of India. The Guardian directed the Hans, effective from Rizwan 1954, to appoint auxiliary boards for each continent, totaling 36 individuals altogether, to serve as their deputies, assistants and advisors. To support the activities, five continental Baha'i funds were inaugurated by the Guardian with the appointment of five trustees charged with the handling of the funds. These funds supplemented the already established Baha'i International Fund, which grew out of the rise and consolidation of the World Administrative Center in the Holy Land. 
Thus, the Baha'i world witnessed not only the elevation of outstanding individual believers as hands, but also the emergence of a mighty institution, which was to grow and display unparalleled potentialities throughout the period of the ministry of Shoghi Effendi and well beyond. Each and every one attained the sublime rank of servitude because of unique qualities and special contributions, which will be the subject of study by future historians. In this production, it's only possible to provide a glimpse of these heroes and heroines of the formative age of the Baha'i faith, and to provide an overview of their accomplishments as an institution. The unique role and significant contributions of the institution of Hands of the Cause of God was to become fully manifest after the passing of their beloved leader, Shoghi Effendi. On the 4th of November, 1957, Shoghi Effendi, the beloved guardian of the Baha'i faith, passed away in London. The Baha'i world lost its exalted and peerless leader. It was Amit al-Baha Ruhi Khanum who announced the news of his passing to the Baha'is. Shoghi Effendi, beloved of all hearts, Sacred trust given believers by Master passed away sudden heart attack in sleep following Asiatic flu. Urge believers remain steadfast, cling institution hands, lovingly raised, recently reinforced by beloved guardian. Only oneness heart, oneness purpose can befittingly testify loyalty all National Assembly's believers, departed guardian who sacrificed self utterly for beloved faith. Eighteen hands of the cause gathered in London on a rainy and gloomy day to attend the funeral of their beloved guardian at the Great Northern London Cemetery. With them were a multitude of other devoted Baha'i friends who had come from far and wide to pay their humble tribute to the one who was the object of their devotion and yet who modestly remained their true brother as Shoghi Effendi referred to himself. Despite their shock and grief, the hands who had gathered in London agreed that an urgent plenary meeting of their institution should be held at the World Centre in the Holy Land. This historic meeting took place on the 18th of November on Ruhi Khanum's invitation. And what Amatol Ba Ruhi Khanum did is historic. It is historical, it's miracles to me, because how it came to Amatol Ba's man to call all hands to go to the Holy Land and keep unity of Baha'i communities all over. Its first action was to have a delegation of nine of the hands open the apartment of Shoghi Effendi, which had been sealed immediately after his passing, and make an exhaustive search for any documents such as a will that he might have left. The day after our arriving in the Holy Land, at um, 8 o'clock in the morning, Lord I.O.S., hand up the cause, Mr. I.O.S., came to our place in the pilgrim house and asked me to attend the master's house through the invitation of Amatul Baharuya Khanum. She invited me to go there and join 
eight hands of the coast there to go in the apartment of beloved guardian uh, to search about his will and testament. And when I arrived there, few were there, and we had a few minutes, and after that we went up in the apartment of beloved guardian. And Amatul Baha <coughs> delivered the keys of the safe and everything. And ask that you are free to go everywhere and investigate if you can find a will and testament. And I remember maybe two or three hours we were in the sea about that. And the other hand were waiting in Bahti, what will be the result of our research. And we looked everywhere, everywhere. We didn't find anything. 26 of the 27 living hams then attended a historic gathering in the upper hall of the mansion of Baha'u'llah in Bachi, which was to be the first of the six annual conclaves that would take place before the election of the Universal House of Justice in 1963. This photo is the only record of that first conclave. And then Amazon Baha had this courage to, fair, to take the first step to invite the hands to come here. And she administrated the first conclave and shared her experience with the other hands and gave the guiding to them. Because everybody was like me. Everybody received the shock. Everybody was electrified by this happening. And nobody knows what to do. 27 people from different backgrounds, different levels of knowledge, different religious backgrounds, met each other for the first time, different languages. They have no communication between them. It was through the translators, the hands of the court, Mr. Bardusi and Mr. Casey, uh, contributed to translation. But I remember, of course, I was so dazed with the sudden passing of Shoki Effendi because nobody expected him to die. I mean, it was a terrible shock. And it was only the strong structure of how firmly he had built the foundations of the Baha'i faith yes. that saved the Baha'i world. Because he had created a structure First of all, we, had, we were used to our uh, uh, elected administrative bodies, our national assemblies. That was all right. We'd had NSAs and we'd had elected uh, local assemblies from the days of the master. We were used to it. We had hands, relatively speaking, recently, more recently. And we were getting used to the fact that we had the institution of the hands of the cause of God. But nobody could ever see that the hands of the cause of God would be called upon, heartbroken as they were, and certainly I was the most heartbroken, to suddenly seize the cause. Mm -hmm. And we did. This is a miracle of the solidity of the Baha'i faith, that at this awful shock that shook us to our foundations, we were strong enough to hold the Baha'i faith together, and then later, through our efforts and through our encouragement and our messages to the Baha'is that we were able to supervise the election of the Universal House of Justice, which incidentally took place in this house of Abdul Baha. It was a very wonderful occasion. The unanimous proclamation from this first conclave addressed to the Baha'is of the East and West stated, the first effect of the realization that no successor to Shoghi Effendi could have been appointed by him was to plunge the hands of the cause into the very abyss of despair. This historic proclamation goes on to describe the true legacy that Shoghi Effendi had left, including a worldwide community represented in 254 countries and dependencies with a world-encircling 10-year plan to be completed in 1963, the 100th anniversary of Baha'u'llah's proclamation in Baghdad. 
He had, moreover, set out detailed plans for the bringing into being of the institutions at the World Center and bestowed the mantle of Hand of the Cause upon 27 believers, who in his final communication in October 1957, he had designated as chief stewards of the embryonic World Commonwealth of Baha'u'llah. Above all, the beloved guardian had left his numerous writings as an everlasting legacy. This proclamation was then signed by all the hands present. I suppose to all of us, it brings back unbelievable memories of suffering and of anxiety and of responsibility. The sudden death of the guardian had broke our hearts. And then this terrible, terrible load of responsibility coming on us. But it showed why he had appointed these hands, because it was the hands of the cause that, worthy or unworthy, and we never felt that we were worthy, just seized the cause and held it until we could have the election in this home of Abdul Baha, of the Universal House of Justice. And I'm very glad there's three of us here. We're a dying species, but we're still here. We all three remember that there wasn't this much for one second consciousness amongst the hands that we should go on holding the power. We had the whole Baha'i world, all the money of the Baha'i world, all the responsibility of the Baha'i world. The Baha'i stood firm. And we took this and handed it over intact, money and power and respect and kudus and everything where it should be in the hands of the International Baha'i Assembly, the Supreme House of Justice. And I think that this is what we will be remembered for. One of the binding obligations in preparation for the transition of authority to the Universal House of Justice was to appoint nine members from amongst the contingent of hands to serve and live in the Holy Land and act as legal custodians. In order not to raise the profile of any individual hand, however, it was agreed that there would be no permanent officers. This remarkable act protected the community and ensured that no individuals would be misconstrued as leader, thus detracting from the purity of their motives, or, God forbid, be seen as a possible successor to the guardian of the faith. Even so, one amongst the body of hands, Mason Remy, later claimed to be just that. The body of the hands spent considerable time counseling and admonishing him that such a claim was totally inconsistent with the will and testament of Abdul Baha. Finally, in 1960, they were forced to expel him from the faith. Here, the hands assembled at the second annual conclave in 1958 are seen as they leave one of the many sessions. The hands had four more conclaves here in the privacy of the mansion of Baji. We all met in Baji because we could go up in the hall and it was absolutely private. Nobody could overhear anything we said. We could have a free, open discussion and express our feelings about the future of the Baha'i faith, the expenditure of the money of the Baha'i faith, what our responsibilities were and so on. Then, of course, we had our meals together. Some of them came back to sleep in Haifa, and some of us remained in Baji. And uh, Bill Sears had a wonderful sense of humor. He'd been a very famous uh, radio broadcaster in America, and he'd been on a very famous program, and he was very witty. 
And Enoch Olinga had a marvelous sense of humor, and he had a giggle. And I used to get so mad with Bill. He would get Enoch laughing, remember, his jokes. And Enoch had this <laughs> lovely, lovely big African laugh. In anticipation of the midway point of the 10-year plan, the Guardian had left a vast, precious gift to the Baha'is of the world. Plans for five great gatherings to be held throughout the world in 1958. The hands were also to fulfill the Guardian's wish that three new houses of worship be erected, one in the heart of Africa at Kampala, the second in Sydney, Australia, and the third in the heart of the European continent, near Frankfurt, Germany. Before his passing, he had personally approved their design, but the task of their completion fell upon the hands. Hands of the cause, Amatul Baha, Ruhia Khanum, and Inoha Linga are seen at the groundbreaking ceremony in Kampala in 1958. And a few years later, in 1961, Amatul Baha arrived for the dedication of the House of Worship of Africa, and then, accompanied by Mr. Ali Nakhjavani, went to the hall. Other hands present included Mr. Sears, Mr. Samandari, Mr. Banoni, Mr. Olinga, Mr. Robarts, and Dr. Muhajir. The House of Worship in Sydney, Australia, under construction. And the completed House of Worship. The House of Worship in Frankfurt was completed in 1960. The first International Baha'i Council was elected at Rizwan 1961, one of the evolutionary stages in the formation of the Universal House of Justice. Those elected were, from left to right, Sylvia Iowas, Charles Walcott, Jesse and Ethel Ravel, Ian Semple, Bora Kavalin, Dr. Lotfullah Hakim, Ali Nakhjavani, and Mildred Motahede. In preparation for the election of the Universal House of Justice, the hands wrote to all national assemblies, providing them with the necessary instructions for completing their ballots. And as a final act of complete self-abnegation, while not wishing to limit the freedom of the electors, they requested that the hands be left free to discharge their duties and responsibilities. On April the 21st, 1963, delegates from national assemblies met in the master's house at number seven Persian Street. They came from all corners of the globe and were gathered here at the invitation of the hands of the cause. This befitting venue saw the election of the supreme body of the Baha'i faith, guided by the blessed beauty Baha'u'llah. The hands oversaw the proceedings and prepared the balloting for the nine members of the first Universal House of Justice. When um, we were thinking about the election of the Universal House of Justice, and Mr. Semple, who is now a member of the House of Justice, was having dinner with me here, and uh, we were talking about how to arrange the election. And I was very, very anxious that we should have it in the home of Abdul Baha. I said, this is really where the Universal House of Justice should be elected, is here, this home of Abdul Baha. So we, he said, you know, I think we can do it. And uh, I got out my father's 30-foot architectural meter, Muru, and we measured everything, and we made a diagram of the house. And we, we decided that if we took all of these doors off, you see, which uh, to just lift off their hinges, that we could make this whole area one huge auditorium. And that then it would be possible for the election of the Universal House of Justice to take place in the Master's and in the Guardian's house. The voting took place here in this building, and then the tellers were handed over the box with all the ballots of the delegates in it. 
And uh, I remember Ernest Gregory was the head teller. And he said, uh, we've counted, counted the ballots, and the count is complete now. And uh, do you want to hear the result? I said, no, no, I'll stack for a law. Don't you tell me the result. I don't want to hear the result. I want to hear the result when you read it out loud to the delegates yes, in the convention. So then we went to the hall that we had rented on Mount Carmel. Yes, and, yes, and yes, we went there, and he told them that nine of our supreme body, and all oh, how excited we were this election of the first House of Justice in the Baha'i world. The waiting crowd of the hands and delegates in the auditorium. As the members took their place on the platform. The joy of the delegates was indescribable as they all gathered at the mansion of Baji to pay homage at the shrine of Baha'u'llah. They also assembled at the entrance of the archives building for group photos. And I remember Mr. Banani's chuckle. He was so full of fun. He had such a lovely sense of humor. He was so warm. And so was Faisi. You remember, Baha'u'llah told his followers when they were in the prison uh, of Akka, and he went in and told them, don't laugh so loud, they will think we are crazy. <laughs> and these hands were so happy, the House of Justice was so happy, it was such a joyous occasion, you see the election of the supreme body, that there was a great deal of joy on everybody's part. That's what I shall always associate with it. The crowning event was the celebration of the Most Great Jubilee, the hundredth anniversary of the declaration of Baha'u'llah in the Garden of Rezvan in Baghdad. This was to take place in London at the Royal Albert Hall with the participation of over 6,000 Baha'is from every region of the world. It was here that the members of the first Universal House of Justice were introduced to a waiting Baha'i world. The crowning glory of the Guardian's 10-year world spiritual crusade was finally realized, and the hands of the cause of God were there to proudly witness the fruits of their beloved's and their own tireless endeavors. A tribute to the hands paid by the House of Justice was conveyed at the World Congress. The entire history of religion shows no comparable record of such self-discipline, such absolute loyalty, and such complete self-abnegation by the leaders of a religion finding themselves so suddenly deprived of their divinely inspired guide. The debt of gratitude which mankind for generations, nay ages to come, owes to this handful of grief-stricken, steadfast, heroic souls is beyond estimation. Immediately following the World Congress, the Universal House of Justice held its meetings here, and a historic decision taken was to have no officers. The hands, who had similarly decided not to have permanent officers, devised at their last conclave a future nine-year plan to commence at Rizvan 1964 and end at Rezvan 1973. This projected nine-year plan was then submitted to the Universal House of Justice for its consideration. 
Among the three major tasks of the nine-year plan adopted by the Universal House of Justice was the development of the institution of the hands of the cause of God with a view to the extension of its functions into the future. Midway through the plan, the Universal House of Justice announced the establishment of 11 continental boards of counsellors for protection and propagation of the faith. Their duties included directing the auxiliary boards in their respective areas, consulting and collaborating with national spiritual assemblies, and keeping the hands of the cause and the Universal House of Justice informed of the condition of the cause in their areas. Thus, the hands of the cause were free to operate on an intercontinental level, to undertake special missions on behalf of the House of Justice, and to assist in the formation of the International Teaching Center in the Holy Land, as had been anticipated in the Guardian's writings. A five-year term of office was later established for the councillors, and their numbers were increased significantly. The historic announcement of the formation of the International Teaching Centre was made to the Baha'i world in 1973. All hands of the cause, wherever they resided, were members of this institution and were to participate fully in its deliberations whenever they were present in the Holy Land. The teaching centre, which was composed of the nucleus of hands residing in the Holy Land, included Amitul Baha Ruhi Khanum, Abul Ghassem Faizi, Ali Akbar Furutan, Paul Haney, and three councillors appointed to this body, Hooper Dunbar, Florence Mabry, and Aziz Yazdi. When the International Teaching Centre was inaugurated, 17 hands of the cause were still living. They are shown here with the members of the House of Justice in 1973. As the appointment of hands of the cause was reserved only for the Guardian, after the passing of these heroic souls, there would be no further hands. But their dual function of propagation and protection would continue into the future through the International Teaching Center and the Continental Boards of Councillors appointed by the Universal House of Justice. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the ascension of Baha'u'llah and of the initiation of his covenant in May 1992, three hands of the cause were still living. Here they are seen with members of the Universal House of Justice and representatives of Baha'i communities from every land. In November of that same year, the Hands joined some 30,000 fellow Baha'is from all corners of the world for the Second World Congress. founder 
of the Baha'i faith, who was a prisoner and an exile, said, I desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. And I think that this is a very, very important and singularly neglected statement of Baha'u'llah. And I think that we should carry out, as Baha'is, more of that sense of joy, of assurance, of happiness. All right, the immediate future is very dark. But we see the distant future, and it's very, very bright. At the beginning of the year 2000, the Baha'i world lost its first lady, Hand of the Cause, Amatul Baha Ruhi Khanum, the last remaining link with the family of the Master, Abdul Baha. Only two elderly and valiant hands of the cause now remained, and the community was in mourning. Posterity alone can adequately pay homage to her services and the historic role that she played in the aftermath of the passing of Shoghi Effendi. The start of the third millennium also saw the completion of the buildings of the Ark on Mount Carmel and the terraces adorning the Shrine of the Bab. The centre for the study of the texts and the extension of the archives building were followed by the completion of the International Teaching Centre. What a joyous occasion it was for the invited continental councillors and their auxiliary boards from 172 countries of the world to meet and celebrate this important milestone with members of the Universal House of Justice and the International Teaching Centre. Coinciding with these celebrations and consultations, the Universal House of Justice provided further overall guidance in a series of historic messages to the Baha'i world. It announced a succession of teaching plans, beginning with the five-year plan of Resvan 2001. It also re-emphasized the continuing dual role of teaching and protection to be carried out by the institution of the counselors. With a spirit of exaltation, we are moved to announce to you the faith of Baha'u'llah now enters the fifth epoch of its formative age. The magnificent celebrations of the completion of the terraces adorning Mount Carmel took place in May 2001 in the presence of the last two remaining hands of the cause, remnants of the precious gift left to us by Shoghi Effendi. They and thousands of others, representing every national Baha'i community in the world, were in awe of the magnificence and beauty surrounding the Shrine of the Bab, as the Oratorio of the Tablet of Carmel put to music 
and performed by world-class musicians immersed them in spiritual joy. This original work came to a climax with the inaugural illumination of the terraces, light upon light, just as Abdul Baha had predicted. was in honor of the beloved Bab who had suffered the darkness of the mountain prison of Marku in Persia and had later undergone martyrdom. It was also a celebration of a community that has gone from strength to strength under the constant and unerring guidance of the Universal House of Justice, a community that has come of age. It was in the Siachal, the black pit of Tehran, that these verses were intoned by the rows of prisoners who accompanied Baha'u'llah. God is sufficient unto me. He verily is the all-sufficing. In response, another row would reply, in him, let the trusting trust. How much has changed since those early days when the faith was limited to Persia? Despite continuing persecutions over the years, the faith has continued to evolve, breaking its bounds in fulfillment of the prophetic words of Baha'u'llah. Should they attempt to conceal its light on the continent, it will assuredly rear its head in the midmost heart of the ocean and raising its voice proclaim, I am the life giver of the world. With the passing of these last remaining precious souls, this unique institution of the hands of the cause of God becomes a part of history and our common heritage. The remarkable story of the hands began with the four heroic souls nominated during the lifetime of the manifestation of God, followed by posthumous referral to a select band of heroes as hands by Abdul Baha and continued thereafter by the appointment of hands during the lifetime of Shoghi Effendi, Baha'u'llah's great-grandson, beginning with those honored on their passing and culminating in the elevation of individuals to this rank during their own lifetime. Never before have a select band of heroes and heroines been so intimately involved with the progress of their religion so actively served at the vanguard of its development and so selflessly devoted to the service of their Lord. Never before has a group of people separated by time and place so faithfully carried out the instant, exact and complete wishes of their beloved leader.
they have obeyed the calling to diffuse the divine fragrances during their lifetimes and set such glorious examples on their passing that generations to come will study their lives, analyze their contributions, and emulate their valiant examples. Ours is to pay homage to them and emulate their examples of self-sacrifice, devotion, and service to humanity. And remember the words of the master, Abdu'l-Bahá. I desire distinction for you, but this distinction must not depend upon wealth, not scientific, commercial, industrial distinction, for you, I desire spiritual distinction. You must become distinguished for loving humanity, for unity and accord, for love and justice. <laughs>